controlled way first. Um, but bit by bit, through, a fluence, through fluency practice, you should be making the language production much more automatic. In other words, you don't have to think and translate in your head before you say anything. It's my second. Uh, the third is it's an opportunity to experiment with language. So it's not just about getting better at what you already know, uh, but developing the range of language that you have at your command uh, so that your language is more complex, it's richer. And researchers, when we talk about fluency, we we would not say that fluency is actually different from accuracy or complexity. The three work together all of the time. So opportunities to experiment, that's my third. Um, this echoes the point that we had earlier on. Um, I forget who made the point. It's an opportunity to learn from the language of other learners. Some teachers are worried that learners might catch mistakes from other students. In practice, this almost never happens. And if it does, it tends to be very, very small details. But there is an enormous amount that you can learn from other learners, not just from uh, what they say to you, but in terms of the feedback that they give you if they don't understand what you're saying and you have to rephrase it in one way or another. So learning from others and the last one, uh, getting this feedback, part of the point before when you're told or, or another student indicates that they haven't understood something, then you're forced to rephrase it or find a more um, appropriate, clearer way of making the point. So those uh, are the main reasons, in my opinion. I mean, there are others that I could add to the list. But I think it's clear, even from this list, that a fluency activity is not just about developing fluency. It needs to achieve a number of other things at the same time. In any kind of approach to teaching which is communicative, I suppose that fluency activities are going to play an important role in the lesson or in the curriculum. And so this is the big question, how much time is needed? And before I give a sort of answer to this, again, in the chat box, could you try to estimate, not just in a single lesson, but over a period of a few weeks, what percentage of uh, the lessons is devoted to fluency activities. Just put in a percentage number in the chat box in your lessons. Wow, we have an in incredible percentage there. Everything going from 5% to 80%. 80% um, I, I find extraordinary. I mean, it depends, of course, on the kind of lesson. Um, and Peter makes the point that it completely depends on the aim of the course. Yes, I mean, I think this is perhaps the most important uh, point to make, first of all. How much time you're going to spend on fluency activities depends on what it is you want to achieve. Uh, in some contexts, there's no reason for it not to be 100% of the time. But I'll take it a little bit further. So th there is no uh, clear answer to this. But as a guideline, uh, I'd like you to look at this diagram, little diagram here. This is from uh, a book by Newton and Nation from a few years ago, and they argue, and I don't think there's much debate about this, that in any uh, course of language teaching, there need to be four main strands. The first of these is meaning-focused input, so that would be uh, through reading and listening. The second strand would be meaning-focused output, which would be speaking and writing. The third strand, language-focused learning, which would be uh, the most traditional kind of teaching, teaching grammar, teaching vocabulary, teaching aspects of discourse or teaching uh, pronunciation. And the fourth strand would be fluency development. And these authors argue that these four strands should be given approximately equal weighting, so 25% each. Um, the two of these strands that concern us most here are the second, meaning focused output, because the output is going to be speaking or writing. And in most, place, in most classes, there's going to be more uh, speaking than writing, but not always. Some, it may only be writing. And the fourth of the strands, fluency development. And fluency is going to be practiced again through speaking or writing. So the, uh, the answer to the question, according to Nation and Newton at any rate, is something like 25% of any course uh, will be devoted to fluency speaking. Now, I'm quite surprised, I must say, uh, by these the numbers that you're putting in here, uh, because this is not what I see, certainly not when I'm visiting classrooms in Austria, where I work. Um, I see the vast majority of classroom time being devoted to the teaching of grammar, uh, 
secondarily perhaps to the uh, teaching of vocabulary, quite a lot of time spent on preparing students for exams and particular task types, and relatively little for uh, the fluency practice activities. And when I ask teachers about this, the reasons that they typically give are one, that they don't have enough time to do everything, and I think that's true in all teaching contexts. The second reason that they give is that in many cases their main job, if you like, is to prepare students for examinations. And examinations are usually more focused on written accuracy, grammar and vocabulary knowledge than they are on spoken competence. So they focus more on uh, those aspects than they do on the speaking, and certainly more, than, uh, more on that than on pronunciation. Um, and I think a, a further reason is that many teachers feel quite comfortable teaching grammar and vocabulary, but they feel a little bit redundant when uh, the students are speaking and they're not really doing anything. I think, though, there is uh, another reason, too, and it's connected with the course books that we use. In almost every course book uh, that you'll see these days for older children and for adults, and for younger children even, for that matter, lessons typically begin with a very, very short speaking activity. But this is often only about five minutes at the most. And then the major speaking activity will come at the end of a lesson. And because it's at the end of the lesson, and because there is pressure of time, uh, many teachers simply run out of time and only have five or maximum ten minutes at the end of a lesson uh, to fit it in. For me, as a, as a course book writer, I always find this frustrating, because although the uh, communicative fluency-based speaking task is at the end of the lesson, it's very often the first thing that we think about when we're writing the material. So in a sense, the way that we write the course books, you have to think of as upside down. The communicative activity is at the end chronologically, but it's at the beginning in terms of the order of importance. So this little diagram is an attempt to, to represent that. And I think it matters because it's very, very clear that students don't always learn what we teach, but they learn a lot of things that we don't teach and probably more learning of language takes place in communicative fluency-based speaking tasks than it does in the more formal moments of a lesson when we're teaching the grammar or the vocabulary. It's, it's those moments, the communicative moments, uh, when the learning really is at its strongest. And there are many researchers who argue that if you had to choose between all grammar and vocabulary instruction or all uh, fluency-based activities, you'd choose the fluency-based activities. The probability is that if you do not do a particular grammar or vocabulary section, it won't make much difference in the long term. But if you don't do the communicative activity, then it will make a big difference in the long term. So it has a, a priority which is not reflected in the way that course books look on the page. Um, and my advice would be quite clearly that if you're feeling under time pressure, uh, drop some of the more formal teaching moments, because they're going to come back. The grammar is always going to be retaught later on. It's going to be retaught at another level. But you won't ever get the chance to do these speaking activities an extra time. That then is, if you like, by way of introduction. Um, but what I want to focus on no, for the rest of the time are practical suggestions about uh, how we should go about creating the time, finding the time for speaking, and what we should do uh, in terms of our management of the class in order to make uh, the most of the speaking activities. I think that um, many of us find one of the biggest challenges in the classroom is actually getting the students to say anything at all in a fluency activity, especially at the lower levels. That's, that's the, hard, the hard job. And you know, they may say something in their own language. But getting them to say it in English is another matter. And it's normal. It's, it's, it's normal if you've got a basically monolingual class, let's say two Russian, two Russian students working as a pair, it's pretty weird to speak English with each other. And because of that, I think that there is a tendency for us as teachers to be quite happy when the students are speaking, when they're saying anything in English at all. But I think we need to remember that the point of a fluency activity is not just that the students are talking in English, but they are being challenged and they're being pushed to speak in English well, that they're experimenting and developing. 
Just speaking is fine, that will build confidence. But if we want to achieve some of the other objectives that I outlined, uh, then we'll need to push them in all sorts of different ways. And, and that's what I want to look at now. Uh, we have a question here, what can we do in a crowded speaking class? I hope that some of the suggestions uh, will answer that question. Um, okay, the first area I want to look at is planning time. We, we can never expect students to have uh, much to say in English if we don't give them time to think about it in advance. And it is very, very often the case that we set off a speaking activity and it simply doesn't take off, perhaps because students are not ready, they haven't had time to think about what they're saying, uh, perhaps they just need a little bit of lubrification, if you like, to, to get into the, the swing of things. Uh, so I'd like to suggest a, a number of ways of approaching planning time. And if you incorporate planning time, which is sometimes incorporated in the, in the course books, but not always, then any speaking activity is going to require at least another five minutes minimum. Um, okay, here's the first of my list. The first and perhaps in some ways the least used is to give students silent thinking time. So we set the task and we tell them this is what they're going to do. Right, just silently you've got three or four minutes to think about what it is you're going to say. The practical issue here is that we don't really know whether they are thinking or whether they're just falling asleep. Um, but even if they're not concentrating, very little is actually lost. The research on silent thinking time is very, very clear. If you compare a group of students who are given a task uh, with no uh, silent planning preparation and a class that's given the same task with preparation time thinking, silent thinking time, the class that does the thinking time will perform more fluently, more, you, they will use more complex language, and possibly, but the research is not clear, they may produce more accurate language. So as a general rule of thumb, we should always consider offering the students the opportunity to have three or four minutes silent planning time, just thinking about what they're going to say. The, uh, the next idea, which is not in isolation because these things can be used together, um, is slightly different. See, there's a question about uh, would it be a good idea for them to write down their ideas? Uh, yes, maybe, but I'm going to come on to that in a second. Note taking, so writing down the ideas. It depends very much on the kind of activity, whether they need to write down the ideas. My experience uh, in the classroom is that when we ask students to write down their ideas, many students will attempt to write down word for word precisely what it is they're going to say. And then they will attempt to read this aloud when they do the speaking. Clearly note taking um, is not supposed to be writing and then reading aloud. The value of note taking is for them essentially first and foremost to write down the ideas. So note taking may even be um, taking notes in their own language. They've got to get their ideas first of all. And providing a few minutes for note taking initially, perhaps individually, and then working with the partner, comparing notes makes sense. It may also um, it may also be valuable simply to write down a few key vocabulary words in this uh, note taking period. So th these two things can be combined. We could begin with a little bit of silent thinking time, and then move on to note taking as a follow up to that before the speaking begins. Um, Rob Barron is asking a question, isn't this counterproductive when training students for exams when they don't get thinking time? Yeah, I think it is counterproductive, um, but I'm not really talking here about exam preparation where we need to put them under pressure far more often. I'm talking about developing uh, speaking skills where we need to take the pressure off. Um, so, yeah, I take your point, um, but that's not my primary concern here. I'm not talking about exam preparation. Um, the, the third idea, brainstorming, is related to the ideas before. Um, brainstorming normally works best when students work individually. They, they write down their own ideas. So typically, here's a task, you're going to talk about this. Here, take two minutes and write down all of the ideas that come to mind, or write all of the, the word, the vocabulary items that may be useful. What then makes the brainstorming more valuable is when the students are given time to compare notes and put their lists together. It's also affirming and it may be more motivating if you do that. Um, I see that Teresa is suggesting using a mind map. Yes, I mean, I think that's a fantastic idea if your students know how to do that. And if you've given them training in using mind maps, 
get the brainstorming done first and then get them to organize their ideas in mind maps uh, makes enormous sense. Next one coming up, topic research. I think in some cases, in some speaking tasks, especially discussion tasks rather than role play tasks, one of the problems is the students don't know what to say because they simply don't know enough about the topic. Um, one thing that I've started doing and I've encouraged other teachers to do is to provide a little bit of time for the students to do a research into the topic before they have to do the task. So I don't know, it, it might be something like, um, what do you think? It's about food items. What do you think is healthier, this kind of food or that kind of food? You might be embarrassed uh, to say anything at all unless you felt more confident. So there are two things you can do. One which is possible for all teachers is to ask students to research the topic they're going to discuss in the lesson before, so they've got some homework time to research it. And, or, in the lesson itself, if the students are allowed to use mobile phones and you have Wi-Fi connection, there's no reason why you can't give them a couple of minutes to research a topic uh, online using their phones. Just simply uh, to give them something to say. And we'll come on to the importance of having something to say in a few seconds. So researching the topic. There may also be times when it makes sense to give students time to mentally rehearse what it is they're going to say. So having planned what the content of what you're going to say, having thought a little bit about the language, again, you can stop the class and say, okay, now I want you silently to mentally rehearse what it is you're going to say. And this will work best um, if they kind of mutter as they're, as they're speaking. So you'll, you'll see their mouths moving, but they're going to be speaking very, very quietly. And this kind of mental rehearsal um, is, I think, particularly valuable for some students who are lacking in confidence at the beginning. A couple more ideas coming up. The first is vocabulary review and research. Now, if a, if a speaking activity happens at the end of a unit or at the end of a lesson, it's almost certainly going to be uh, recycling the language which has come before. Um, I think it makes sense to give students time to look back into their course book or look in their vocabulary notebooks and review the, uh, the words which they may well want to use as, um, as an alternative or as an extension to this. Again, I use the first language, ask the students to think about what it is they're going to say, uh, think about the kinds of words they're going to need, and there will almost certainly be some words in their first language which they will want to use, but they don't have the English equivalent. I give them time to use dictionaries to find out how to say these things in English. Again, this is all about building up the content so they've got something to say. Um, the, the last of these is providing useful language support, and many course books do this. They'll provide some useful phrases. The problem with useful language support is that students often end up trying to use this language even if they don't need to use it. Um, so I think that the useful language support is often uh, valuable when it's provided, but when they get onto the speaking, probably best to take it away or they close their books so they don't start reading these things aloud. So that's a list of ideas for, for uh, planning time and you'll see that if this is taken seriously then uh, this is going to require quite a bit of time. But the payoff will come in the speaking itself when the, the, the spoken language production will be richer, more complex, it will be more fluent and uh, it may be more accurate. Um, Time to move on. The, the second big idea that I want to explore is task repetition. Uh, how should I introduce this? I suppose as a, as a general rule of thumb, I believe that if a piece of material is worth doing, it's probably worth doing twice or three times. And one of the issues with using course books uh, in most contexts is that teachers are expected to get through the course book, always to get onto the next page, get onto the next lesson, the next unit. And it may well be the case that um, dropping the next lesson or even the next unit sometimes makes sense if they're going to learn more from doing something else a second time. And I think this is particularly true of uh, oral fluency tasks. Get them to do the task again. And the reason for this is not only uh, that they will get more speaking practice, but when they repeat a task, the kind of practice that they're getting is qualitatively different the second or third time from the first time. The first time, maybe we should just be happy with them saying anything in English, 
But when they do it a second, a third, a fourth time, uh, then we would expect them to be more experimental, to challenge themselves more with the language that they're using. So I'm going to suggest a variety of ways of uh, getting students to repeat a task. I think the key here is that you can't just ask students to repeat a task for no reason at all, because there's nothing less motivating than say, right, good, now do it again. And so here are some suggestions about how to go about repeating the task. Um, the first is by using different partners. Uh, it's usually the case that students will uh, work with their regular partner to the left or to their right. Let them do it with their regular partner the first time. When you get them to repeat it, we get them to speak to the student on the other side of them or to the student who's sitting behind them or in front of them. Just switching the partner so that they've already practiced the content, they've used the language once. But if the task is sufficiently interesting, it will be motivating to do it a second time with uh, a different student. Other ways uh, of doing this, changing the partners around, um, I've, well, we've tried to illustrate with these uh, pictures here. The, the second picture there is supposed to show students moving around the classroom. So move around the classroom, they find a partner to talk to, they'll speak, they do the task for a few minutes, and then at some point stop the class. I sometimes just clap my hands, find a different partner, and do it again. And this, of course, can be repeated uh, as many times as you like, although probably three or four times is enough. The third picture in the middle here is, is, is an attempt to uh, demonstrate what is sometimes called the onion technique, where you have a, a little group of students uh, in the middle of a room. These are standing up because it's easier to do it standing than seating, but you could do it with chairs. They're facing outwards, and then another ring of students on the outside, so that each student is, is facing another student. They do the task for a few minutes with one student, and then uh, they'll move around and talk to the person next round in the circle. Uh, the third one uh, suggests that perhaps half of the class can be sitting down, while half of the class are moving around and changing partners. So there are four different ways, or four or five different ways, in which we can get the students to move around and repeat the task with a different person. Um, let's move on. Um, the, the second of these is, is extremely well known. It's usually called the pyramid. This is uh, takes the following form. Students work with the partner, first of all. Let's say the speaking task is, is to compare um, two things or to put uh, a series of items in, in an order, a ranking list. They do this with a partner, and then when they've had a few minutes, this pair of students joins with another pair of students so that there are four students, and they bring their ideas together, and then they compare and repeat the task. This can be built up. Again, it depends on the size of the class. So you go from initial pairs two to four. That can be built up to eight. And then we can move towards a whole class discussion, even if you wish to go that far, where all of the ideas are brought together. So the pyramid is, is a fairly well-known way of getting students to repeat a task. The third one I'd like to suggest is that the students take on different roles while they're doing a task. And again, this is a, an attempt to, to illustrate this. Rather than simply having students working as a pair, we could build this up and have students working in groups of four, where two of the students are um, working, essentially doing the speaking and the listening or the speaking together, and other students take on different roles. And the sorts of roles that we could have would be one student could be asked to be a note taker. Um, a note taker, for example, might down any interesting bits of language or interesting ideas that they hear. They could be a language monitor where they will note down any examples of the mother tongue being used. Because if students say something in the mother tongue, presumably that's because they have something to say but can't say it. So later on, we can look back at these notes and look at ways of expressing it in English. There could be a chair who makes sure that the, uh, the students are getting an equal amount of time. And there could be a timekeeper or a chair and a timekeeper making sure that the eye is on the clock and telling the students who are speaking, you've got one minute left or two minutes left. And these roles can be ro rotated so that the same group of three or four could do the activity again with different students taking different roles. So changing the roles uh, is another possibility. The fourth suggestion 
um, is to reduce the time limits. So if a particular task, let's say, is typically going to take about four or five minutes and get the students to do it within that four or five ti minute time limit, and then they repeat it, preferably with another student, but the second time they do it, the amount of time they're given is reduced. So we go down to three minutes, and they've got to do the same thing in three minutes. They can repeat it a another time, and again, we'll reduce the amount of time that's available, perhaps down to two minutes. And this approach is sometimes called the 432 technique, although you don't have to be strict about the amount of uh, time that you're reducing it by. The value, of course, in doing this is that in reducing the time that's available for the students to do the task, they're going to have to modify the, the, the language that they're using. It's kind of forcing them to convey their ideas more economically. So reducing the time limits. And I'm going to come back to the issue of time limits in, in a little while. The, the suggestion is, is that we introduce some kind of time delay. So if we, uh, for example, began a class with some kind of discussion task, a fluency task, let's repeat it at the end of the lesson, exactly the same task, later on in the lesson, uh, probably with different partners. Or if the, ta the task, the speaking task, was at the end of a lesson, fine. In a subsequent lesson, perhaps the next lesson, the following day or two days later, they do the same task again and again, preferably with a different partner. And in this way, again, as with the reduced time limits, the kind of language that they'll need to use is going to be rather different. Um, the next suggestion is concerning notes. I, I said earlier on in the planning that we could get our students to, to make notes, to brainstorm notes about what they're going to say or the language they want to use. Uh, when they then come to do the speaking, it's very difficult for them not to read the notes aloud. That's fine then, so I let them do that very often, just refer to their notes, but when they repeat the task with another partner, the notes are turned over, and this time they have to do it without any notes. A couple more ideas to come before we wrap this up. Um, additional planning time. It may well be that the first time you do a speaking task, the activity hasn't gone uh, terribly well. Um, so there's not a lot of point repeating it if it hasn't gone well at all, unless you do something in, in the meantime to help them do it better a second time. So once you've got to the end of a, a task, they've finished the task, say, right, good, okay, fine, now we're going to do it again, but I'm going to give you three, four, five minutes to think one more time, individually or with a partner, about how you could improve what you did last time. I also do this sometimes in the middle of an activity. Um, when an activity, a speaking activity is not going very well, I simply say to the club, right, stop, 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 shh. Now, we need some more time to think about this. And uh, I'll simply interrupt the activity, say, right, you've got three or four minutes to plan this a little bit better. Get your ideas together, think about them, share ideas, and then we'll start again. So I'll give them the extra planning time in the middle of the task, and typically they'll start the task again from, um, from the beginning. One extra thought here about this additional planning time is, again, depending upon the level, um, I will allow the students to use their own language. And the reason for this is that I'm primarily concerned with getting them to generate ideas. That's the most important thing, that they've got something to say. And it's much easier to brainstorm ideas, to come up with ideas in your own language, uh, than in a language where your level is, let's say, A2 or B1. So they can brainstorm ideas, plan additionally in their own language, and then go back to English for the task itself. So additional planning time, and uh, the next one, yeah, OK, I'll let, using the first language, I think I've said enough about this. And my last consideration is recording and repeating the task. It's quite common in many classes, and I certainly had to do this as a schoolboy myself so many times, to do some kind of speaking task, particularly a role play. And then the teacher would say to two of the students, right, now come to the front and perform this. As a student, I always felt extremely uncomfortable about this, having to go to the front. But even when I wasn't nominated and other students who were doing it, I felt two things. I felt, first of all, relief that it wasn't me. And secondly, I felt total boredom having to listen to other students performing it. There has not been a lot of research into this aspect of public performance in front of the whole class. 
Um, but what research there is suggests that it may be a very limited value. If you can use it as a motivating tool, fine. But it may not be the most motivating tool for the class as a whole. It may only motivate a relatively small number of people. Much more effective, and this has been research, is for the students to record the speaking that they do. And I see that Severia is suggesting using something like Vokaroo. Uh, Vokaroo would be fine, but I mean, you could simply use uh, the recording function on your mobile phone. Um, and there are many, many other apps that do this. You record the speaking. You take some time with your partner listening to this speaking, thinking about the language you've used, and then doing it again. So generally speaking, and, but this does take time, recording and repeating is going to learn to lead to more uh, learning gains than front of the class performance. Okay, some other, some other thoughts. I talked a little bit about time limits and how it makes sense uh, when we're doing task repetition to restrict the amount of time available each time they repeat the task, this 4-3-2 technique. Um, but I'd like to say a little bit more about t uh, time limits uh, before we move on. Speaking in English or speaking in, in any uh, other language is an activity which is characterized by pressure. There is enormous time pressure. We've all experienced it speaking another language where we've got ideas that we want to get across, but we don't feel we have the time. We're worried that the person we're speaking to will get fed up. Um, my experience here in Austria is when I'm trying to speak German, many people will simply hear my not very good German and then come in in English and do it for me. The pressure is, is there and, and, it's, and it's very, very strong. One of the things that some teachers do, therefore, is they give their students a lot more time to, to express the ideas that they want to express. But paradoxically, this is not always terribly helpful. It's by putting the students under a certain amount of time pressure that we're forcing them to become more fluent. The more time you have, the more probable it is that you'll be thinking about accuracy and less about what it is you actually want to say. So the most general recommendation is that all speaking activities uh, will benefit from time limits of one kind or another. It's after all um, the pressure of time which leads to the features of spoken language. All of the things we do in speech which are different from writing, uh, things like hesitations, repetitions, using unnecessary words, as I'm doing I'm sure all of the time now, paraphrasing things, self-correcting ourselves, all of these features uh, are features of spoken language and they appear in spoken language precisely because of that time pressure. So we'll need to teach students these techniques, We teach them how to hesitate in English, teach them how to uh, paraphrase things quickly, teach them how to correct themselves effectively. And this will be separate from the, the main speaking activity. It really ought to be part of the course, I think, teaching students these uh, speaking micro techniques. But when they're doing the speaking itself, give them time, but never too much time to do the activity. And then, as I say, repeat it, making the, the pressure greater each time they have to repeat it. This is the only way, really, that we're likely to get the kind of automatization of the language that is part of the objective of, of what it is we're doing here. So time limits, I think, is, is important. But paradoxically, by using time limits for speaking activities, we'll actually need more time because we'll need to do it, the activity again and again and again. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to an end here. Um, one broader area that I want to talk about reflective activities. It's quite fashionable these days to, to get our students to, to reflect on their language learning, to reflect on the activities that they're participating in in class, to reflect on the progress that they're making. And these reflective activities are not always popular with teachers because it's very difficult for us as teachers to see what students are learning from them. But again, research is really very, very clear on this. Getting students to spend some time reflecting on the speaking activity that they've just done or did the day before is likely to lead to learning gains and it is likely to lead to a greater sense of autonomy, independence as a learner. Now, 
The simplest way of doing this would be simply to turn to the class and ask them to discuss in pairs or groups how they felt the activity went. How well did you do it? What could you do better? What would you do better next time? But um, we can structure this in a number of ways, and I'd like to suggest just two. In the written version uh, of this webinar, which will be available, as I say, sometime next week, um, I'll provide links to various resources where you can get more ideas. Um, the first of these ideas um, is the following. When students are working in pairs, build this up to a threesome rather than simply the pair. And one of the students' role there is simply to listen to what's going on. Their role is to listen to the interaction that's taking place between the two main students who are speaking, and then to provide feedback um, to the other students. And the feedback is not just on how well one student expressed their ideas or how accurately they expressed their ideas. The feedback should focus much more on things like how you thought both students felt. How good were these students, not just as speakers, but how good were they as listeners? Were they sympathetic and supportive listeners uh, when they were uh -huh. listening to the other persons, uh, the other students speaking? So this kind of feedback, uh, we've got some funny noises coming in here. Can we, Louisa, can we mute a microphone at your end, please? Thanks. Um, these kinds of things, which would then lead, lead quite naturally onto a repetition of the task, um, have a very clearly demonstrable value. One final uh, suggestion I'd like to make, and this is from um, a book by Christian Go and Anne Burns, <gasps> Teaching Speaking from a few years ago. Um, a superb book, um, but, but long, many years to read. We have some interesting uh, microphone noises coming in here. This particular activity is a speaking diary, and I've reproduced it here. Um, we've got uh, some guided questions for the students to write down their thoughts about the speaking that they've been involved in. And you need a bigger piece of paper than this, but you need some space too for the, uh, for the teacher to read these comments and then provide their response to it. I think what's useful about this particularly is that it's not just that it's an opportunity for students to reflect on the work that they've been doing, the difficulties, the ease, what they've been learning, their frustrations, and they'll have a lot to say. But when it's shared with the teacher, it's an opportunity for the teacher to find out about how the students are feeling about the speaking activities, and that will then give the teacher information about how she could change the way she's managing the tasks, uh, perhaps by exploring some of the ideas that I've been suggesting today. Right, that's uh, my time is, is up. Um, we have, well, we have quite some time for questions, uh, but I hope that I've provided you with, with enough practical suggestions of, of ways you could explore managing the activities. Um, but let's see what, what kind of questions you have. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Philip. That was fantastic and hugely insightful. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, so, I mean, that's all we have for today, but we would love to hear some of your questions. So, I mean, and uh, we've just been looking at some very interesting and um, questions uh, coming through during the talk. So, um, if we have a question from Peter Rodder, so, um, um, saying that many of these ideas sound focused on a transactional type of speaking, but what about more interactive speaking? Uh, what about more interactive speaking? Um, I'm, so they, they seem focused on transactional kind of speaking, and what about more interactive yes. speaking? When a student uh, can't really formulate what to say before hearing their talk. Really yes. uh, yes. their talk. Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Um, the the majority of the ideas, yes, I suppose you could say that they are um, looking at transactional tasks. But in a sense, what I mean by a fluency-based task is it's likely to have some kind of clear output, which is non-linguistic at the end. And so students will be transacting uh, in that sense to try to achieve that. Um, the interaction is going to be, well, I mean, interaction is going to be taking place in, in any kind of task. Um, perhaps the only thing I can say in response, because I'm really not sure that I fully understand, is is this. Some of these activities are clearly more suited to some kinds of activities than others. Um, most of them are appropriate to 
a, a, a kind of task, let's say a, a ranking or a grouping or a prioritizing task or a, a project-based task where you have to come up with ideas and make a presentation afterwards, all of these kinds of things. Um, if the task is much more uh, freewheeling and open-ended, um, then these activities are less likely to be effective. But I would suggest that if the activity is more open-ended, it would probably benefit from a clear outcome at the end. So I apologize um, if, if that's the wrong answer to the wrong question. Uh, but that's as, that's okay. as good as I, I can I do at the I moment. Peter typing, so he might elaborate okay. for I, us. I think I'm um, sure. Uh, but uh, uh, there's also okay, another good, good. Up here from uh, Nadal uh, Hassan, uh, who said that mental rehearsal might end up taking too much time to teach. So how can we avoid this in class? And maybe how much time should we be giving for um, mental rehearsal? Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, the answer to the question will clearly depend. Um, not just on the task that the students are doing, but on the level of the students. But at most levels um, that we're talking about, and, and the vast majority of students around the world are learning um, up to B1 and a bit level. Once we get to B2 and C1, the numbers are much lower. At, at a B1 or an A2 level, you can't really expect any student to speak in a single turn for more than two or three minutes, absolute maximum. That's already quite challenging. Um, so even if there are a number of turns, in the speaking that they're going to do, there should never be more than two or three minutes, I would have thought, for mental rehearsal, although you might break the activity up and give time for mental rehearsal in the middle. But I think it's important that mental rehearsal is not like an actor where you're preparing your lines and you've got to get them right. It's simply to help you come up with new lines. Um, so in terms of the time devoted to mental rehearsal, it probably should never be more than, well, Okay. Three or four minutes, okay. absolute maximum. Um, and uh, we have a question here from uh, Martina at our Kobash on the same topic of mental rehearsal. And she's just asking how, uh, how exactly is that different from uh, them writing these whole sentences in advance? Um, how is mental rehearsal different from writing whole sentences in advance? I mean, okay, the first thing to say is we really don't want our students to write whole sentences in advance. But when, when you're working with a new class or classes that are not used to this kind of work, it's very difficult to persuade them not to do so. So I think that what you'll have to do is do it bit by bit, allow them to write sentences in advance at the beginning, and then over a course of lessons, uh, reduce the amount uh, of time that you allow them to do this and make it clear that it has to be note-taking. And it may make sense, maybe a very good idea, to show examples of good notes rather than um, you know, notes which have just perhaps organized in a mind map, keywords here and there, an organization. Do it that way. So I think that that writing sentence in the month is something we need to get away from. And the mental rehearsal should be um, the working from keyword notes and just saying to yourself the sort of thing that you're likely to Thanks. say. I see that Peter's come back. Um, I'll, I'll just read the question here. OK. Right, OK. I, I understand the, the point here. Uh, Peter, I'm sorry, but I don't really. If, you, if, you're, if you're buying a coffee in a, in a coffee shop, of, of course, you can repeat this in, in many, many different ways with different roles, people taking different roles. But I don't really see why you can't do that um, when the speaking task is just some kind of hanging out chat. You'd still be doing it with other students. You can still move around, do it with different time limits. Um, so I don't really see any particular difference there. I would have thought anyway that the probability is that there's going to be more uh, transactional speaking than this kind of chit-chat speaking, um, because it's very difficult to maintain chit-chat speaking except at higher levels, much higher levels, uh, unless there's some kind of clear outcome to the task okay, at the and, end. Uh, Pete, yes, so that's me. I, uh, sorry, Louisa, back to you. I have a question um, here from Marina. I, uh, sorry, uh, if you ask, what is the best um, way to assess a speaking Marina. activity? Uh, if you ask, what is the best way to assess a speaking activity? <laughs> What's the best way to assess a speaking activity? Um, the, the best way to assess a speaking activity is not to assess it. Because as soon as you start assessing it, then the activity has changed. 
And the assessment criteria will necessarily impact on what it is that the students are doing. That's always going to happen. Assessment is going to increase the, uh, the pressure, the feeling of discomfort, and in some ways will totally transform the activity because students know whatever a teacher says that they're more likely to be assessed on accuracy than anything else. So if assessment is not necessary, then really don't assess. And if anything, I'm encouraged the students to self-assess. That's probably a more valuable thing. If the uh, assessment is a necessary part of the speaking activity in the classroom, then whatever criteria you use, it's very, very important that the students know what those criteria are. But what the criteria would be uh, will depend very much on what it is you want to measure in the um, in their spoken performance. I've always felt um, quite strongly, and I'm not advertising Cambridge examinations here, I've always felt that the speaking um, criteria for evaluating speaking in all of the main Cambridge exams are particularly valuable if you adapt them in different ways. So it may be that in one lesson you say, listen, we're going to focus simply today on interactive uh, aspects of your performance, how well you interact with the other person and on your fluency. We won't be looking at let's say accuracy at all, but students need to know what it is that you're doing. But clearly this is, um, this is rather different Certainly. from developing the speaking. We've also had difficult to mix the two together. And from a number of people around a, a few learners' self-confidence, around how to handle learners when they don't have yes. the confidence to speak with their peers and to provide feedback with their peers. Um, so, do you have any specific uh, um, words of advice on dealing with uh, learners that are dealing with giving feedback, even to the students in class? Giving feedback, even to the students in class. Um, well, I suppose I can say a couple of things. First, first of all, um, forcing a student to speak who's not ready to speak um, is unlikely to be productive. And this will be particularly difficult for them um, if they've really got nothing to say. So I think that you have to think of the development of spoken fluency over a long period of time. It's not over one lesson or two lessons, but it's over the course of a semester that you're likely to build up that confidence. In the early stages, too, and particularly with lower levels, um, it may well be that the speaking that's provided is not fluency speaking. Perhaps what they need more than anything else is to get their mouths, their speech organs around the language so that every time they produce a sound, it can't, it, it's not difficult for them. So at the very lowest levels, very controlled speaking, uh, let's say dialogue work, where they've, they've studied a dialogue, they've perhaps memorized parts of the dialogue, they're reading aloud the dialogue, has quite strong justification, building them up towards the ability to speak in a more uh, spontaneous and fluent way. So it takes a long time, and of course, it will depend very much on educational cultures, and it will depend on the individuals. Um, many students simply will not want to, and forcing them is not really going to help, however much we feel as teachers that they really need to speak. The other issue concerns feedback, I suppose, and um, students who are very, very reluctant to speak are likely to be intimidated if we then correct the, uh, the errors that they make. In terms of feedback with those kinds of students, anything they say, perhaps we should provide positive reinforcement, and this will be more valuable um, rather than just being general, yes, well done, you made a good effort, but focusing on particular examples of language they produced and said, I notice you said this, that was good given very specific feedback about what they did well, uh, but avoiding uh, too much corrective feedback with those students who are less secure. Um, very often, though, I think the question is, is they're reluctant to speak because they find there's, there's just too much cognitive challenge thinking about something they have to say and say it in English and try to produce this language accurately and fluency is simply too much. So breaking the whole thing down, giving them a lot more planning time, building them up to it, before asking them to say anything, has got 